Good afternoon, and welcome to Praxis Peace Institute's Friday program on Zoom. I'm Georgia Kelly, the director of Praxis. Today, we are hosting an expert on zoning, urban planning, the housing crisis, and will offer some solutions as well. Tom Angotti is a professor emeritus of urban policy and planning at Hunter College, and is on the Earth and Environmental Science faculty at City University of New York. He directed the Hunter College Center for Community Planning and Development, and is also adjunct professor at Parsons and the New School in New York. He is the author of New York for Sale, Community Planning Confronts Global Real Estate. We'll get into some of that today, which won the 2009 Davidoff Book Award. He is also the author with Sylvia Moore of Zoned Out, Race, Displacement, and City Planning in New York City. If you have a book handy, maybe, uh, maybe you can hold it up, Tom. I, I have the PDF instead of the book. <clears throat> it's called Zoned Out. So maybe it's not quite so handy. Uh, that's okay. We can do that later. I may have given away my last copy. I don't know. I'll keep looking. That's okay. We can get started with the interview. They'll know about the book and we can put information in the chat box about it. Okay. Okay. So the first question I want to ask you, um, we'll deal with a term that is thrown around a lot but very little, if anything, is ever done about it. And we talked about this earlier in the week, and that is affordable housing. You mentioned in your book that it is usually referred, what is usually referred to as affordable housing is really middle-class housing. So what would real affordable housing look like? How would it be priced? And a second part of that question is, you mentioned that market-based solutions don't solve the problem. They just kick the can down the road. So can you talk about what, what affordable housing would really look like price-wise and why the market-based solutions don't cut it. Okay, well, thanks. Thanks for inviting me um, and good to see you all. Um, let's, as as a, an urban historian, uh, I look at how did affordable housing arise in the United States? And it's actually happening all over places like Europe uh, affordable housing is where it's at. Both private and public developers are proposing affordable housing. It's not radical. It's not different. But why in the last 20, 30 years has it arisen as a priority uh, from both private and public sectors? Well, the one reason is we don't have public housing anymore. Uh, the federal federal uh, funding for uh, public housing has disappeared. There's no low income housing being built. But the demand has gone up. Uh, the homelessness crisis nationally has not abated. It continues to grow. And it's not just in big cities. It's in small towns and rural areas. Um, so the demand for housing, the need for housing, I should say, because it's not just market demand, the need for housing, for low-income housing, for people who are unable to enter the market has grown. At the same time, uh, developers have found themselves in a bit of a quandary and this is in big cities and small towns as well. Um, the market doesn't support a, a, a high enough rate of profit to attract capital to the real estate to real estate development. There are many other uh, uh, places to invest funds that can produce more. So. Public-private partnerships and um, uh, affordable housing that mixes subsidies with private development has become the major option uh, in both public and private sectors. Um, and this is not something that came about because of advoc advocates like 
me and others for low-income housing. It came about because developers also found the need to pad their spreadsheets and guarantee a minimum rate of uh, return uh, by attracting some public funds. So you have the public-private partnership um, and affordable housing is a way, is a, a, is a short way of saying, we're gonna build market rate housing with a minimum proportion of affordable housing. Um, uh, and, and this will allow uh, investors to make money on their investments and it will uh, serve a public need. And of course, the end result has been overall, the uh, investors work out, uh, uh, turn out taking the money home, but the public need doesn't really get met. I can tell you from firsthand experience, day in and day out in New York City, where we've had affordable housing for over a decade, two decades, um, the community activists that are dealing with housing policy, the housing access, the phrase that I hear all the time is affordable to who? Because the people who, we have more homeless people than ever in history. There are over 100,000 people that can't afford to buy anything on the, on the market. They are not the recipients of affordable housing. They will not be. Uh, they don't. They don't have the minimal uh, um, capital accumulation to be able to enter this public-private partnership at all, even with the affordable housing. So that's why the thing I hear from activists all the time is affordable housing. Is that what you're going to give us? Affordable to who? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's the question, affordable for who? And I don't think that's usually asked, certainly not answered. And we, we also spoke about public housing, which I think is um, a, a really important part of what you're talking about too. And in Vienna, they've had this, as you mentioned, over a hundred years. And you said there's also public housing in New York. And it's not just lower lower income people who live in this public housing. So it's not like, the post-World War II uh, gray buildings we associate with public housing. So I'd like you to talk a little bit about this different kind of public housing. Yes, well, um, in the 1970s, um, uh, there was a huge drive in the United States at all levels of government uh, to end public housing. Ronald Reagan heard the call and did it. He ended public housing. Public housing was demonized and it was widely uh, pilloried in, um, in the public uh, realm as part of the problem, not part of the solution. It is true that ever since it was first created in the 1930s, it was underfunded. So uh, adequate funds were not put into uh, enough amenities that would make it truly livable for families. So public housing has always struggled. New York City has had probably one of the more efficient and best public housing authorities in the country. But it's um, billions of dollars in debt. Uh, it has a huge stock of housing with serious structural problems and they don't have the capital. Federal government has stopped funding uh, public housing. Uh, so it has become, uh, and you know, the private developers have fed this myth that uh, if it's public, it's gotta be bad. It's gotta be crime ridden. Uh, it's got, it's and. I can tell you, I've spent a lot of my time working with public housing tenants in New York City. Yeah, there's good and there's bad uh, public housing, but everybody's struggling just 
to get enough funds to maintain the housing that was built in the 1930s because public funding has gone down every year and uh, Congress has refused to feed public housing. Ever since the 1960s, uh, uh, when Nixon, Reagan um, uh, ended public housing, it's been demonized as uh, the problem and not the solution. So in New York City, we're fortunate to have, have had a vibrant uh, housing movement that pushed for state legislation. And we have a, a state program it was very successful in the 1960s. And the labor unions were especially powerful at that time and pushed to get public subsidy to build uh, essentially uh, uh, co-op housing. It's, it's mostly co-ops um, that were partially financed by labor unions, uh, the state and the city. And uh, they survive, many of them. Some of them have been privatized, but it's a, it's one of the few viable alternative solutions to public housing. Uh, and there's a bill now in the state legislature here uh, to go back there and uh, create what is being called social housing. Social housing is now a term that's used throughout the housing movements as an alternative. Uh, you can define it in many different ways. But I think the activists in the housing movement define it mostly as um, socially beneficial, not market market rate, but available to working people uh, who who need housing. Nice. And um, it's it's widely spread in Europe. Um, many European countries have had things which are term social housing, there are alternative uh, terminology in different countries, but um, they've gone that route. Why? Because the public um, alternatives have dried up and during the neoliberal surge, Margaret Thatcher and, and all of her allies in Europe the public was demonized as the problem and not the solution. So social housing is now being used as a term. It, it, it was a term that was first used in Vienna in the 1910s, uh, before the First World War, where the, it was entirely publicly financed housing for working people. It survives today. Uh, look at some of the pictures. They're beautiful housing units, well-preserved and supported by local government, including the, uh, I mean, it started in what was called Red Vienna, which was socialist. And it's been continued by conservative governments who are anything but red. And uh, because it works. And it works because government continues to subsidize it. Yeah, I found that interesting. In fact, I'm going to send the article that was in the New York Times about the Vienna public housing to everybody on the call, because I thought it was very interesting how beautiful these look and the gardens that are up in terraces. Yeah. And um, I think they're from one to three bedrooms and they don't just, um, it's not just people with lower income that live in them. When they start earning more, they can pay more in rent, but they, they um, have a ceiling on what the rent, what percentage of the rent to income is. And that, that's the kind of thing we need. Rent has never been tied to income in our country. It's always the market. It's mm -hmm. never tied to, to reality. So before we get into our local thing, I wanted to ask you just one more thing. And that's um, some of the areas that developers have used that have been so problematic in, in building what we really need, You know, the spec housing that's going on, um, house flipping, uh, where they just build a house to sell it, and a lot of these in our area are luxury houses that are selling for two million and more. So 
I don't know if there's something that can be done about that, but it's the kind of growth that is really going against what we need in the community. I don't know if you see that where you are or have any ideas of how that can be stopped or if it can. Well, the, the only solution I know of, and it's universal, is people have to organize. Yeah. And organize, get together, build strength, um, develop coherent arguments, and enter the political arena in a way that you can turn things around. And um, uh, we've had we've had the same phenomena in New York City. It's only on a different scale. So the developers have been singing the same song for the last three decades, you know, well, more, uh, which is uh, we, we're in a housing shortage. So we got to build more housing. And well, you know, the spreadsheets don't work out unless you guys subsidize us. Mm -hmm. So we've had a program that ended last year, actually, fortunately, that uh, heavily subsidized um, real estate developers for building any housing. Why? Because we have a housing shortage. Oh yeah? So you're building luxury housing with public subsidies, tax breaks, tax relief, um, zoning um, um, uh, goodies that increase the value of your development. And you get all of those things. But then let's look, let's look and see, look at some of those housing. They're the largest uh, rate of vacancy uh, in the city is in those houses. Why? Because they're all spec. It's all speculative. Developers are using their zoning benefits, their tax benefits, and cash benefits that they're getting from the public sector uh, in order to, to build, but they're not building for uh, the needs. They're building for a global market. So we've got people buying these uh, luxurious condos that occupy two or three floors of a uh, uh, skyscraper and they're making uh, tax breaks and they've, they've gotten subsidies, not direct subsidies, indirect subsidies, which allow them to walk away with the profits and uh, and that's where our greatest vacancies are in New York City. We have 100,000 people who have no home. They're sleeping on the streets or in shelters. And if, uh, if we could occupy every one of those vacant units, we'd solve the homeless problem overnight. Yes. That's that we have a lot the same in our area where we have a lot of vacation rentals that are vacant a lot of the time. So now I wanna to go to our local problem, which I've also talked to you about before today, which is the Sonoma Developmental Center. And I'm gonna let some other people talk about it because they know more about it than I do. But basically the state of California, uh, uh, I guess it owned the site, but it's in a partnership with Sonoma County that allows the county with the community to chart the future role of the Sonoma Development Center. But the community has not really been part of the decision-making process. It's been our kind of bought and paid for um, representatives on the county uh, supervisor board and other local people who've been elected but don't really represent the people. So um, I'm gonna let someone, uh, Jerry, I'm gonna let you talk about it a little bit and ask anything you want of uh, Tom. So go ahead and unmute, Jerry. Yeah. Um... Thanks, George. So, so uh, I agree with the way you laid out the basic situation. As I probably everyone on this call from Sonoma knows, uh, recently the court overturned the EIR and the specific area plan for the Sonoma Developmental Center 
the which was the result of this uh you know ver very uh captured uh planning process that Georgia described and the court really uh just took the uh the county to, to and and their lawyers to task for developing a really absurd EIR that was lacking in substantial evidence to support findings about uh, impacts to wildlife and wildfire corridors. And uh, one of the, and what the locals were advocating was uh, what's called a historic preservation plan, which involved a much higher uh, degree of affordable housing. Uh, but the uh, developers claim that uh, it, it wasn't financially viable. And one of the reasons that they provided, presented for that was they grossly uh, overstated the cost of uh, uh, rehabilitating a lot of the current buildings. And uh, I've been working with a group that's been advocating for adaptive reuse of some uniquely um, uh, uh, buildings, buildings that would really serve uh, co very affordable co-housing. So I guess one um, question I would have for Tom is um, in addition to the, what we generally think of as affordable housing, is there any kind of co-housing uh, movement in New York? Um, no, not really. Outside of the city, yes. Uh, upstate New York, New England, there are a number of co-housing uh, projects, but they're more suburban and rural, um, which may be closer to your situation. Yes. Um, yeah, the closest thing we would have in New York City is union-sponsored uh, labor union sponsored uh, housing. Uh, and for the last century, um, there have been quite a few of the projects. Some of them have basically been privatized, but some of them still exist. Uh, some of them are viable co ops. Um, but, uh, um, but, uh, there also New York City it just has so many individual uh, experiments in housing alternatives that are never uh, talked about. Um, started by groups of young people, groups of older people who get together to share housing. And they don't call it uh, shared equity or shared, shared housing. Um, but yeah, it's a it's a it's an important alternative model that um, that you know developers can't see that be, unless it squares with their bottom line. Uh, it may not be so profitable for them. So I, right. Yeah, I've known a couple of developers who who actually talk the talk, but they never walk the walk. Yeah, that's the thing. It's like. What kind of a develop developers can we get into this large property that won't do the same thing that we just went through? Um, I, th I think the answer well, the to that, that is. Well, I'm sorry. Uh, what? No, I was just a, a footnote. Is is that? Yeah, this is very common. Um, we have such weak public uh, servants, uh, right. the public entities are so weak, they allow developers to call the shots because the developers say, we have our spreadsheets here. And it what you're suggesting, uh, co-housing, uh, social housing, uh, it, it doesn't pencil out. We think it's a great idea. Oh, of course we want more affordable housing. But they control, they have the spreadsheets. We have a public sector that either doesn't know how to read spreadsheets 
or um, defers to the developers who have already talked to the mayor, have already talked to the city council people, and have already made the deal, sealed the deal. So, um, you know, we, our uh, planning and housing agencies are ill-equipped uh, to contest these spreadsheets. Um, and it's even in New York City, where we do have a more sophisticated public sector um, we have a bunch of dunces sitting in the offices who are um, who are uh, advising the mayor on which way to go. Yeah, well, Georgia, just to to uh, <laughs> make one response to your last question, uh, a lot of people have been advocating for a public trust uh, to take over that land. And uh, Norm Gilroy and some other people have developed a plan which involves that. And now that this the uh, county's plan has been overturned in court, I think there's a real possibility that we might eventually see something worthwhile there. Because SDC is a really unique situation since there's already all that development. And some of those buildings are uniquely suited for really low cost housing. Yeah, that's hopefully with this going back to, I guess it looks like it's going back to the drawing board in a lot of ways. It probably yeah. um, gives he us- owns the land. Pardon? The state he owns, owns the land. This It's a state owned land. It, it, it's a redevelopment center that was closed. Well, doesn't that give you a leg up on um, you know, it's not privately owned. It's owned by a state entity. <laughs> Unfortunately, I've dealt with the, its development, uh, Department of General Services. They they think and act like uh, real estate brokers. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I mean, that's just the that's reality. Good. But but uh, but there's been this particular piece of land is really very special, beautiful piece of land, and there's a really strong public movement to preserve it and to use it for public benefit and and that and, trust yeah yeah i think gina you wanted to say something yeah yeah just to clarify the state the state wants to sell it so jerry's right talking about the real estate they they want to sell it they don't really want so the a public trust being created would have to be able to all somebody would have to still have to buy it from the state. That's, so that's, that's right. yeah. And how do you determine the value? And, and um, so, but you know, this is all about this mess happened because about how our politics works in this County and we're a minority corner of the County for um, so when you need three members of the board of supervisors to do anything and you get four who don't give a hoot or have other agendas and look a different way, you know, that's a whole lot of why we got this really bad plan that the board of supervisors adopted. And um, that's that's why, too, behind wanting to do the public trust to get it out from the county government entity. It's very, but, but I'm just, I actually though, I wanna, I wanted to ask the question because I wanted to share you another, another um, organization that I'm involved with on a, on a government matter. So here in the state of California background for you, we have what we call county offices of education. And we do what a lot of state department of educations do in other states, but the size of our state, there's a lot that's delegated on a county level. And we, uh, it, I, the bottom line is what I'm trying. So I sit on the board. I'm a locally elected official. I sit on the our Sonoma County Board of Education. We own land. We want to do a workforce housing project, meaning an educator workforce housing project. A few years ago, we did find a nonprofit partner, um, and then found out that. Teachers and in all education, we, we consider anybody who works at a school site 
if you're working with kids during the school day, whether or not you're the credential teacher, you are an educator. So we're looking at housing for all kinds of people in those jobs working at schools. Well, despite what we always talk about, how low paid teachers are, the fact is teachers are paid too much to qualify for a subsidized project to be where we have to create very low, low or a certain target of moderate income. So the original developer we were working with said, we can't do this because we rely on like the tax, um, the tax credits. Um, I'm trying to remember who that developer was. I think it was Bridge Housing. So we had to go back to the drawing board and find a different kind of developer. And so now we're in this quantity because quite frankly, to bring the units down to the rent, these will be rentals but where we need them to be. We are, our, our, our deputy superintendent for our business side is, is working on it to find other sources and maybe there is some potentially money from the state targeted for educator workforce projects. Um, anyway, so I just wanted to share why you can have the best intentions and we have a particular target. Uh, you can't, we have a super hard time getting teachers and educators in this county, in the state, because of how high the cost of living here. So I just want to give you another, my, my, my question is more like, you know, I'm, I'm in part of a government tr trying to do something. And um, I just described to you all of our, our issues. All the frustration. Well, you're not alone. Um, uh, it's, it's always a struggle. If you're really struggling for uh, social justice in housing, um, you're going against the stream. And every state is, has a powerful development community, which sets the standard, which is market rate housing. Yeah, it seems it's very hard to get past that understanding of housing prices is this market based because the market changes and goes up, but the salaries don't go up in, in relationship to it. So it just doesn't work. Um, Katie, you have your hand up. Katie? Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you so much for uh, joining us, Tom. Uh, I admire New York so much. And uh, this is a, a vigorous, uh, uh, just a turbulent topic. Um, I have worked as a psychotherapist in affordable housing. I have worked in uh, homeless housing. Uh, I've been around the block quite a bit personally with it, so I, I could say quite a bit about that. But um, it's demoralizing. It has been for me very demoralizing because there's a homogeneous, uh, both the staff and the people I worked with in my particular situation here in California, in several situations, uh, are discouraged and not motivated, most of them, to really help, help or help themselves. That was my experience with uh, Novato, Mill Valley, and uh, everybody's dis discouraged. I hear what you're saying about it being... Uh, a, requiring activism, I guess the only question I could think of besides there being more problems than solutions, um, and I've also studied co-housing, which is a bit of a mixed bag as well, um, is there anything we could do as activists in pressuring the Biden administration in this case uh, what's happening there, they give words to housing, but is there anything we could do in a movement to say we are really pissed and we would like something to change? Well, you know, it's, it's, um, it's complicated at the national level. There's insufficient advocacy from con Congress. A long time ago, the so-called liberal wing in Congress gave up on public housing. Yeah. 
I, they they just said, well, we're just not going to get it. It's finished. Mm -hmm. uh, Reagan won and we lost. Okay. And it's a very weird dynamic, too, because HUD was created during the uh, yeah. Johnson administration as a result of a powerful civil rights movement. And the first HUD uh, director uh, was a black man. And unfortunately, HUD has become a, you know, a, a place where you can, where you can put uh, political appointees who happen to be black or house or housing advocates and um it's 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 not sufficiently funded doesn't have significant power um we're in a country that where the federal government has national government has no jurisdiction over local planning unlike most countries developed countries in europe where mm -hmm. national government sets the agenda for local government. Here we have our wonderful uh, federal government, 50 sovereign states who do whatever the hell they want. Mm -hmm. And um, and HUD is very, I went to the 1996 Habit, International Habitat Conference in Istanbul. I remember that. It was amazing. I went with a group of uh, progressive planners and activists and um, scholars. And um, we were um, advocating that um, the Habitat Conference, which is a UN conference, uh, advocate vote, uh, vote in favor for the right to housing, universal right to housing. And the U.S. and Israel were the only two countries who would not support it. And we worked with the liberals in HUD who went to the conference saying, well, we are constitutionally, we're, the, the states have the constitutional authority for housing and local planning. So we have limited power. So HUD is was created as sort of an orphan child and continues to be orphan within a government where military expenditures get every you know are, are always getting approved and uh, but gets very little can't even maintain existing public house, housing around the country so it's the federal system our wonderful federal system that allows states to set planning and housing policy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so you get, you get very often housing policy that's, that's controlled by local property interests, um, a particular developers, mm -hmm. um, development interests. And, um, and that's something that, that really, we really need a constitutional change here. Um, uh, but it starts at the local level, starts at the state level. And um, and um, yeah, that's the reality, though. Uh, Jerry has his hand up again. Yeah. Um, for those of us who've been advocating for uh, housing at uh, Snow Developmental Center, one of the ways, one of the terms we've been using is workforce housing, similar to what Gina was talking about. And one question I have, which either Gina or Tom might be able to answer, is if you've got some uh, subsidized housing, let's say in the case of SDC, subsidized either by the county or the state, does, let's say, the county have the authority to give first priority to people who are employed locally? And one of the reasons that's important is because one of the justifications for uh, workforce housing is the environmental benefit of cutting down the commute for people working in the area. 
So maybe Gina, you might know the answer to that since you were working in that area. Yeah, well, a, a couple things that I know. So we have a way as a, a local educational agency, um, the state has had, there's been some laws that happened to make it easier for school districts and county office of education to build housing on land that they own. Because we've got a lot of closed school sites in the state of California, and it's already happening. There are San Jose, Los Angeles, where they've taken former school sites and converted them to teacher housing. So we, I know we have laws that make that possible um, and also help us. <laughs> Basically, cities and counties can't turn us down. That's one of the other things the state did and sort of protect us from NIMBYs. So, which, as you know, matters around here. So sure. that, that's what I know in the education world. The other thing I've learned from following the projects that have been built here in the Springs, like the Mid-Pen Project, the Pre Project in Siesta Way, and when I've talked to some of those builders over the years and Luther Burbank and Burbank Housing, so... When they get federal funding to subsidize, like the tax credits, going back to the tax credits, they are not allowed to say, well, only they, it's all based on income for the qualifying. And they're not allowed to say, you have to be living here already if you're already doubling and tripling up locally. That, so that would then include working if you're working here already. You can't. But what they do, I can remember years ago talking to Scott, what's his name? And he worked for Mid Penn and did the project that's there on Highway 12, you know, the uh, betters, whatever we're calling that project. Anyway, so, that's, so then it comes down to how you market it. So knowing that they can't say if the county housing authority sends people to Santa Rosa, they can't deny putting them into the lottery. But what they do, though, is the, how they market it. So if they're here in the back, because that was always been my concern, are we making sure we're building housing for the people who are already here, working here, you know, doubling, tripling, whatever up in, in uh, sleeping on somebody's couch, what have you. So then they try to deal with it by how they're marketing it. So they only advertise, if you will, in, in within all the local nonprofits who interact with people who may need housing versus doing countywide or regionwide. So that's how that what they do to get around the rule that forbids them from saying, well, you're sleeping on somebody's couch in Santa Rosa or Nevada or whatever it may be. And so therefore, this is just already for people who are living here. If they're getting the federal funds, they're not allowed to discriminate that way. That's, that's well, I mean, it's no. part of that driven by a concern for racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. Um you know well maybe maybe it harkens back to that but but it wouldn't be in you know we're talking about who a lot of a lot of the workers who need housing in Sonoma Valley are Latinx but but maybe historically maybe that's where it comes from historically I I don't know um, did you want to say something to that we have the same problem here in in New York actually um for years the city has, um, we have we have a huge stock of low income housing. And um, when it's owned by the city or financed by the city, um, we have a law that says uh, vacant units can only be distributed via a citywide lottery. And ostensibly this became the means of um, preventing uh, uh, raci racial uh, uh, concentrations in the city. Actually, it was the result of a lawsuit was brought by some very conservative group uh, who didn't like the fact that new affordable housing and, and city-sponsored housing, 50% uh, of the units are reserved for uh, people within the existing neighborhood. Uh, it wasn't a great policy, but it was a better policy than having a citywide lottery. Because what happened with the citywide lottery is it became a giant hurdle for people, working people to go over 
you had to have, you practically had to have your own lawyer uh, to fill out all the paperwork. Uh, it would take years uh, uh, on the waiting list before you could ever. If you look at the results, it hasn't contributed to the to a racial mix. Um, so <laughs> it's uh, I would I would I think the consciousness of racial um, segregation is important. And it's something I work with a lot of black and brown communities all, all the time who are concerned that if subsidized housing comes in, they're going to be out. Now, is, it, is there something wrong with that scene? It, uh, you know, it's supposed to be um, to favor uh, black and brown um, families who are looking for housing. But it's doing just the opposite. It, you open it up to a citywide lottery. Who has the funds and the time to wait, uh, uh, to enter the lottery and wait for four years, five years in order to get an apartment? And then it turns out the apartment isn't truly affordable to low income people. So the result is, and I see this all the time, all the rezonings we fought. Oh, you're going to get affordable housing. Oh yeah, through the lottery, you get, you enter the lottery and your housing is not gonna be affordable and you're probably not gonna be black or brown person. Now I'm gonna go back to Jerry, but before I do that, I wanna bring up something that I noticed because I moved three years ago um, and I'm a renter, I'm not a house owner. And when I moved, I didn't know all the things that had changed in the process of, of getting a rental. It was startling. Of course, I expected first and last month's rent. That's normal. But I did not expect first and last month's rent and a third month's rent for deposit. All of a sudden, that gets that mushrooms. Then they want bank statements and tax returns. So what this does here is, to my mind, it's like redlining. How many Latino families are going to pass all these tests in our area? And it's a way of just keeping out people without ever saying we're keeping anybody out. It's market, market demands this. They're at the kind of, it's a corporate template, I think. This is what corporations are requiring of incoming tenants. But what it's doing without ever saying it is leaving out a whole section of the community, primarily Latinos in our district. So I just wanted to bring that up and get that on the recording because I think it's a really important thing that people who don't rent have no idea this is happening and it's just under the radar. But in my mind, it's a type of redlining. So anyway, I wanted to just say that. And do you have the Yimby, Yimby's there? Yes, in my backyard. You have what? Yimby's. Oh, Nimby's. Um, um, yeah. We Yimby's. Do. Yeah, we have Nimby's. Yeah. Uh, Jerry, yeah, we've got a, no, the yes. No, he's saying the yes in my backyard. Oh, yes. Oh, the yimby. Oh, uh, yeah. We need more yimbies. <laughs> right. <laughs> uh, Jerry, well, you want to say something? That, oh, go um, ahead. Yeah, no, well, there are, there are groups that call themselves yimbies who are really financed by the developers. Oh. Um, yeah. To get past homeowners and low-income renters who don't want to see major new market rate development in their neighborhood. Oh. And then they're fighting it. Oh, you're Yimbies. Well, that's one of the things you brought up uh, in your yeah. book was to create community boards or community groups that really start having power coming together, which I think is where we are with um, the Sonoma Developmental Center. We're we're reaching toward the end of the hour, so I'm going to ask you now to make it uh, brief, Jerry. Yeah, okay. Well, I just, I mean, this is a, a really uh, uh, useful discussion for me because what I'm learning is that my general way of thinking about housing at SDC as serving at, as being workforce housing, you know, m might not be that realistic given all these barriers to, uh, you know, pr prioritizing housing for people who are working in the area. So uh, that's just one more thing for us to deal with as a local community 
uh, advocating around SDC. Yeah, I think it's a good thing to be thinking about it. I would not have thought about that before either. So thanks for bringing that up, Gina. Uh, Katie? You need to unmute, Katie. I, get, I want to just uh, say again, Tom, thank you so much, because, you know, this whole piece about the Constitution uh, and major mo movement activism, I think you are, among some others, majorly contributing just by being here today, because so many people do not understand this phenomenon. And, uh, you know, so that's my main point is to Please uh, encourage you to keep speaking in, in large communities and small. Um, and I, you know, I think other people don't know. Also, there's such an oxymoron around the whole mobile housing situation, where you pay fifteen hundred to two thousand, you know, to a month to just live there, and then you pay two hundred thousand to buy one, or maybe one fifty if you're lucky. It's just a, it's a. It, yeah. It's macabre and then three houses that sit empty be, because on the next block or five or 10 because they're in Italy for half the year. Right. Uh, Howard, you wanted to say something? Sure. Um, I just, uh, I'm in Arizona and we've had a number of newsworthy events recently on the question of homelessness and, and the like. And I've, I've also uh, spent many years involved in the world of homelessness, not as a homeless person, but uh, um, studying it and actually at one point embedding myself in the homeless community. But I live right across the street uh, over here is Paradise Valley, where the average home price is north of $4 million. And when I talk to normal people and we talk about affordable housing, they think we well, just make it smaller. So the people around here, they think, well, your gate, your entrance gate will be lower and your uh, swimming pool won't be as yeah. big, you know, and your putting green will be uh, smaller and so on and so forth. My point is that that I think it may be time for just shattering the, the paradigm of what affordable housing is. And I was really interested when Gina mentioned something about uh, repurposing um, schools that have closed into a housing um, complex. Uh, I, I can see the same potential for with uh, closing shopping centers and things of that nature where there could be a total paradigm shift in what affordable housing is. Any comments on that, Tom? Thanks, Howard. Yeah, it's, I, I think that's, that's a real important task is to change the discourse, to change the conversation. Um, it, because, you say, oh, we need more affordable housing. Okay, build it. That's not the answer you need. Um, I did, I, I I worked closely with a group in New York City for years called Picture the Homeless. It was a homeless advocacy group, which was made up of homeless people and advocates. And we were facing the story that city government said, which was, we got to build more housing. There's just not enough housing. That's the way to solve the homeless problem. Well, they've been telling us that for over 100 years. And there are more homeless people now than ever. And so what we did, and uh, I work with the activists in the organization. We did a survey of uh, a, a sample of neighborhoods and communities around the city. Uh, a representative sample to count vacant housing units. We, we only uh, surveyed a third of the city. And we found that there are already enough vacant housing units to rehouse every homeless person five times over. In other words, five times more housing than you would need to house the homeless people. So we issued the report, big press conference and everything. And the next day I get a call from the city's housing agency. Oh, could we, could you share our data, your data with us? I said, uh, well, 
ask picture the homeless because it's their study. They never ask them, of course. Right. And uh, it's it's the political will. There's no, there's no political will to do it. There's plenty of existing building housing, and now we have vacant office buildings in Manhattan. A boom. What are they being held for? Oh, we can't make a profit because because to convert it to luxury housing, to market rate housing, uh, but it would cost too much. So they're going to sit there vacant again. The highest vacancy rate in New York City is in the multi-million dollar towers that were built over the last 20 years with speculative capital. Yeah. And uh, those buildings, these are these are like 50, 60, 70 stories tall, are some of them are three floor uh, condominium extending to three floors, four floors, pure investment property, but they're vacant most of the year. That's where the vacancies are. We've got the resources. We don't need, need to build more housing. We've got to socialize the housing. Ah, there and we go. Get, get this back to social housing. Socialize the housing. I like that. I do too. Yeah. So yeah. Well, we've reached over our hour, which I really appreciate the time you've taken with us, Tom. Thank you so much. I will send you a link to the recording tonight. So you will have it. It'll be on our YouTube channel. So thank you. Thank you. you. Thanks for inviting me. You're certainly welcome. It's been very interesting this hour. So, end the recording. <laughs>